so yeah, I've got a uh, important deck for us to walk through, largely going through um, where we are right now and our pathway forward. So it's a continuation of our inflection point and pivot point and our execution plan. So we're going to spend a good chunk of time on that because there's a, it's a lot of meaty content. Um, then we're also going to have Justin Gia um, help share some of the work that he's been doing on his student ambassador program, which is going to be badass. Um, and uh, then we're going to close out with some music. Uh, so, you know, that's uh, that's our goal here is we want uh, the all hands meetings to be informative, educational, but fun and interesting and a method to open up our creative minds for a, a great week. That's the that's the objective. Um, all right. So we're going to get started. Um, let me see here. I'm going to post up the presentation. Again, want to confirm uh, my screen is showing up OK? Can I get a confirmation? OK, because I can't really see anything. Yeah, we can see. All right, thank God. OK, so this is the moment of truth, guys. This has been a very uh, interesting roller coaster ride, uh, at least for me, for the past few weeks or so, or rather, since we've launched. Um, and. Um, I want to try and put some heavy focus on how we're going to execute over the next few weeks. Um, and it's really all about building our product, building our community, and getting funding. That's really the absolute ultimate thing we need to accomplish uh, in a very short term. So continuing the strategy that we laid out uh, at the beginning of the year, one, we want to build a product that we will use, love, and recommend. Two, invest in our community and grow our users. And three, raise funds. So it's always important we think about where we are relative to our goals, the impact we're going to have, and our progress towards that. So uh, this document is open for everybody to browse through. So uh, you'll all have access to this deck in Notion, and you can just click through through all the links. So we're going to jump right into our OKRs and KPIs. So the story uh, for us um, is. We've got a long way to go <laughs> relative to the uh, to the goals that we've had. Um, and so we always start off first with one of the impacts that we're going to make on the world. So helping with individual wellness and health uh, through exercise and other activities, uh, helping in local communities and helping the world uh, through science uh, and technology. And then finally, getting paid out for that. So our aim is to help achieve um, that social impact right off the bat and demonstrate that Leyline as a proof of concept and as a core loop is already working. Uh, so good news is that it, it is. Uh, we have users that are on our platform. We have a thousand active, or twelve hundred users now registered, and a good few by 400 or so that are, like, have been activated. Um, and it's growing, which is great news. Uh, in terms of where we were like four weeks ago, we've jumped up about 300, uh, 300 users in the past two weeks, actually. Um, so uh, we've got a, a long way to go. Uh, but uh, as we talked about earlier, we're at that inflection point. And so the focus of how we deliver value as quickly as possible uh, to get the word of mouth and viral effect through our referral friend program. Um, but the, uh, the, the new things we got to also focus on is, OK, if we're going to measure how uh, our community is going to trust and love us, uh, one easy way to start doing it is just by net promoter scores through surveys, uh, which basically means, uh, do you recommend Layline to your friends? Um, and let's just start getting a sense of, is the answer yes or no? And let's quantify it. Um, so anyway, it's, it's just really important that we continue to always focus uh, on where we are right now. And the challenge is we've got a tremendous amount of work to, get to, to do in order to get to hitting our goals for Q1. Um, and so there are a number of things we want to do. Uh, and first and foremost, we want to start dog fooding our product. So it is time for us to start feeling some pain. And what I mean by pain is we got to use our product and it is not going to be great 
because uh, there's so much to improve and change, and that's why I want to deploy every single day. So going forward, starting today, every single person at Leyline should have an account at the minimum. If you don't have Leyline account, I'm going to be so shocked and surprised. Um, and we want to start the pup on our leaderboards. So as you know, we've already deployed on Leyline.gg our leaderboards in the social tab. Uh, we've also deployed username, so you can show uh, who you are and have some pride on your position. So in theory, the whole Leyline team should be showing up on leaderboards. And we're going to expand it so that we see every active user that's in the alpha. Um, so you can go ahead and plug in and make sure you're starting to show up and get an active. Uh, and the reason why this is important is because when you start to experience bugs and slowness and weird user experiences and messed up user flows, you will start to say, we need to fix this. And I have access to fix these things. Um, so that's why it's really important that we need to do that. And uh, I'll explain why the pain is born. Um, was someone going to say something? Oh, by the way, if you need to ask any questions, uh, please feel free to raise your hand uh, with the, the button there, and I'll try to pay attention uh, as things uh, continue. Um, OK, and then the other thing is we want to use a scientific method, and we just want to use science in general. And the key here is just running lots of experiments. And the thing about science is that experiments fail all the time. It takes thousands of experiments before you finally get to that eureka moment or to validate a particular hypothesis. And so every day as we're shipping and deploying from staging into production, we should be asking ourselves, what did we learn today? Did it make a difference? Uh, did it drive any of the objectives that we have in terms of user growth or driving exercise or linking up white accounts? Um, and what did we do wrong? What did we do right? How do we execute and how do we pivot on that? So we all have to be asking that question and we all have to be product developers. So uh, the best way to know what is going on is start to bookmark these pages. Well, one, the Leyline roadmap is really putting the high level priorities lined up in sequential order to see what we're building feature wise and when we're targeting to ship it. Um, so it's uh, it's really important everyone's familiar with this because uh, we're all going to be product managers here. That's the that's the objective. Um, and in addition, we also track all of our bugs and features on Zen Hub. So we are a tech company and a software company. So it's just good to get familiar with the actual code and how we're implementing it. So I mean, I'm not asking you guys to be coders, but we should be as close to the code as possible. <clears throat> All right, so that is the key. The first thing we've got to do is start getting knowledgeable about a product to feel the pain and start to build a desire to fix things very, very quickly because we're going to ship every day. So what we need is for everybody to pitch in. So going forward, everybody is a developer. Whether you're going to participate as an engineer, a designer, or editor, or a project manager, or coordinator, or a tester, or translator, any number of these activities are things that are going to help building our product. So don't just think that, oh, I have to be an engineer, or I have to like have some kind of academic expertise in software development to actually make a difference here. No, that is not true. We are all creative, intelligent human beings, and we can pitch in however we can. So we are designing this, um, this system to allow anybody to plug in and help out. So we're really going to start to test that. Um, second, everyone is also customer service. So I don't know if you guys have seen the show uh, Undercover CEO is kind of like where to take the super rich CEO that's like so disconnected from the ground level. They make him pretend uh, he or she is a like ground level worker. And then they have some revelation and they realize, whoa, I'm a total jerk and I totally mistreated my employees. Like, I, I don't know if you guys have seen that, but that's essentially the story. Um, to me, like that is so broken because every CEO should know exactly how the product's function what the service is like, and what the customers are experiencing. And so all of us should feel what the customer feels, because we become so much better at how we treat our, each other and also how we treat our users. So number one thing is get on Discord. Discord is so awesome, because it is where our community is gathering and giving us lots of great feedback. Uh, whoops. No, 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 no. Can you guys still hear me? I might have messed it up. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, great. So it, this is where we get, you know, post up our FAQs. We make announcements for all of our release notes and patches and uh, share our all hands VDs. Uh, we are able to help in real time. Anybody that wants to be a part of the alpha that wants to give us feedback. And this is where we build the trust and love is in this place. And so the key is creating a holistic customer experience. It's not just about having a website. It's about creating something that people are going to want to engage with. So the great thing about being in this community is, one, we improve their customer experience by training them and educating on how this stuff works, how to actually get started. By doing that, we get feedback around what are the frequently at frequently asked questions, what are the main pain points that we have to improve on. Uh, we can fix their bugs when they have issues or at least report and respond back to them and say, hey, got it. We know that we have a ticket in place. We're going to address it and make sure that we listen to you and fix your user experience. Um, the third is this is a our channel to be transparent as possible. This is our core value is being open and transparent and honest about everything so that we could be held accountable. And it's also building our culture. Um, as you know, we've got a great uh, internal team culture here in terms of being supportive and helpful and positive and optimistic uh, and having fun. And we can extend that into our community and it's already happening now. And then fourth is that we want to empower our community. The way we want to build this thing is this, again, it's an open source, open knowledge project. So the community should be a part of how we develop this product. So they can give us feedback. They can vote on specific features or ideas and work on and be a part of our governance. They can make proposals and have a sense of ownership on this platform. So on, on our side, we actually get to get amazing user insights. So we can run polls anytime we want or surveys. And then we do a Q&A with the community every single Saturday. So we get direct face-to-face -face feedback all the time. And I cannot stress enough how valuable that is for us um, to to be able to iterate and to respond to actual user needs. And so by doing this, we build trust and love. And the, the thing about building trust is that the essence of building trust is actually just revealing who you are layer by layer. That's how you make your friends, that's how you build relationships, is you expose and become vulnerable. And so this is what we are doing. This is our core. Our transparency is actually a, a competitive advantage because we have nothing to hide. And by revealing everything, it allows us to build trust very quickly. Um, I'm gonna check for any hands raised or anything like that. Okay, cool. So this is a the focus on product. It's not just the product and the website, it's about the entire customer experience. And, in or, and if we succeed in doing that, that is what's going to enable us to really grow users. When we help people hit the aha moment and when, they, when we get them to say, this is so good, I'm going to bring my family into this. I'm going to bring all my friends to this because I'm earning money for doing good things and it's helping to save the world. That's the kind of revelation we need to provide to our users. So for now, on a product side, it's about building that core loop, that minimal viable product, and getting us to the point where we can now start referring a friend. So again, you can look on our roadmap to see what the team is actually building out. And with refer a friend, the secret here is that we're going to build these incentives um, into the actual referral. So you earn ley line points, your friend earns ley line points once they get active, and you'll get these super exclusive non-fungible tokens that will only be minted if you refer a friend and get these achievements. That's the only way you'll be able to get these things. So if you're interested, again, look at the deck here. You can click through and actually see the wireframes uh, on Figma. Um, I won't... Uh, uh, load it up here is going to take forever, but uh, you can see all of the different wireframes that we have and refer friend is right there. Uh, but soon we will have it implemented. But this is a gateway because once you have uh, somebody that gets your product and becomes an evangelist and they start referring it and they start, uh, those people start becoming your evangelists, that's when things start to go exponential and that's, that's the plan. All right. Um, so that's uh, the product um, focus. The second bit is investing in our community. So right now, 
Um, this is a, a very, very simple map of what the user journey uh, looks like. Uh, the first step is you build awareness. And this is like where you know we start to have uh, interviews and press releases, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which then leads to acquisition. People hook are like interested in like, okay, fine, there's something here. Let me like register and create an account. Uh, but and that is where we spent a good chunk of our time for the first two to three months uh, building this out and starting to go to market. And we were successful now that we have 1,200 users and signups. Our stage is how do we now engage them and make sure that we don't lose them by not catering to their particular needs or fulfilling a specific problem that they have. So this is now the focus when it comes to investing our community is less on trying to get more users because we want to make sure the users that we've already got are having an amazing customer experience. And that shapes how we're going to communicate with them. Um, and so if anybody wants a preview of how we're organizing the ideas and strategy, um, we do have a mirror board, which is linked uh, from this deck. And you can see that starts with goals, strategy, um, and tactics. So we set the goals here, which is all consistent about the impact we're going to have. Um, then we think about what are the goals we want to hit the channels through which we can communicate to our users and the content that is going to be relevant and useful for them. So this is a very key component of the customer experience, which is how do we communicate with them? Um, so for example, a key strategy when it comes to communications is gonna be CRM, which is our emails. So we have 1,200 emails now. How do we actually activate and communicate with them and say, hey, this is what we're working on. Here's our newsletter for a recap of all of our patch notes. Uh, this is the major milestones that we hit when it came to improving science and helping cancer research. These are all ways that we can engage with our uh, customers that we have not had a chance to uh, execute yet. <clears throat> So these are the things that I mean by investing in our community is creating that holistic customer experience. And a lot of it comes down to just good communication. <clears throat> uh, any questions, comments, and surveys? OK, that is a good sign or a bad sign. I don't know. Um, so uh, since we went through our pivot point, uh, in order for us to uh, adjust to new strategy, our organization needs to flex accordingly too. And that is really key. We're in a startup mode. Uh, we're always going to be a startup, I think, because uh, the tech world is kind of crazy and how fast it moves. So we always need to have this malleable structure to orient around new strategies. So it's better to model your organization around strategies than try to create a strategy that like fits into some kind of weird uh, structure. So uh, anybody can look at this overall org chart. It's linked on the PowerPoint presentation. But the way we're trying to organize it is just figure out, hey, we are a very wide network of individuals participating on this project, both full-time, part-time, volunteer. Uh, we're constantly having people on board, constantly having people to go dormant because they have to take care of their life and other priorities. Um, and what we're trying to do is figure out, okay, how do we organize all that? Because this is scaling very quickly. When you have 70 active people on a project, you need to have a really good structure in order to scale. So what we're doing is creating our focused pods to align towards our strategies. So there's a product pod, which is focusing on building a product that we will love, use, and recommend. Um, then we have a marketing and community pod focused on engaging with our users. And then finally, we have a fundraising pod to make sure we're raising enough money to sustain the organization. <clears throat> um, so yeah, this is, uh, this is part of the restructuring. So again, this is going to be available here. I don't want to spend too much time into that, but we'll work with the individual pods to make sure all the roles, responsibility, and process uh, have uh, gone through change management smoothly. So coming into where we are now, the biggest challenge is that our fundraising strategy did not raise the money that we needed to hit sustainability. And so we've talked about this, and uh, it's why we're in our pivot mode right now. But the challenge is we have run out of cash. And so this is what I want to talk to you guys about today, uh, which is radical transparency. So. Um, I, I have no idea how this is going to play out. 
and you guys have probably decided on how we like edit this video, but I'm going to show you everything. Uh, so to give some context, uh, let me take some coffee here. Um, all right. So to give some context, uh, when I started uh, Leyline, it was under a number of fundamental uh, hypotheses. Uh, one is the explosion of blockchain and cryptocurrencies um, and the market and where the technology sector is going to go, um, as well as the fact that we are facing probably the greatest crisis of our generation, both from a health uh, crisis with the pandemic and an economic crisis unfolding because of this massive disruption to our economy. And that economic crisis is going to lead to major social distress and these are things that are going to happen that are just a preview of what climate change is going to do to our society. So we've got some big problems that we need to solve. And so I was sitting there uh, thinking, what are we going to do about this? And I figured there is opportunity. So this was my plan when I first started this thing was how do we fund an effort that's going to start to fix things in a big way? So this is my personal uh, budget and plan here, and I'm going to show you everything. So what I did is I diversified my portfolio, and you know I've told a little bit of the story around how I sold my house, how I pulled out all my retirement funds, and uh, just put it all into the organization. So at around the June, July timeframe is when I started to get very familiar with the crypto space and what was happening uh, following the economy and what was happening when it comes to printing trillions of dollars and the stock market bubble and all of these very interesting trends, uh, as well as the like international trends on how developing nations are moving. And so it was very clear to me that crypto was going to go crazy and boom, whoops, I'm sorry. <coughs> and uh, uh, so what I did is start to invest uh, based off of what I was seeing. And so I set up a game plan, which was what, how much runway do I need to start a company? And my end goal is I want to raise enough money that I can establish a campus, which is going to be a place for refugees to uh, have a safe place to live. And particularly uh, my friends and family, because I'm very worried about what's going to happen. So I based some assumptions on how I was going to invest and um, knowing that this is the opportunity of a lifetime when it comes to crypto, I diversified my portfolio and had multiple scenarios on how much money I'd be able to raise. So based on my hypotheses, where I would have landed right now if I just sat on it was probably around the multi-million dollar range here. Um, but I instead decided to invest in building this thing because what I realized is if I'm a multimillionaire sitting at home watching Netflix and literally the world is falling apart and exploding, we're talking about crazy crisis levels, um, it means nothing. It absolutely means nothing because we're just going to be living in a burning world and that just sucks. So. So that's what I did. I basically took everything and put it into Leyline. Um, and so the story was that crypto boomed and it allowed me to really build a pretty heavy runway and just go all in hardcore because we need speed right now. Um, but the challenge is I have drained my funds now. It is pretty much all used up. And that is what this document is, which uh, Shahul, uh, who is an amazing human being, has been working really hard to keep our accounting and finance in place, and Jamie as well for, for staying on top of everything. Uh, but yeah, I've had a lot of bills to pay to, to run the organization when it comes to particularly engineering and marketing. Um, but also kind of sustaining the uh, payroll uh, and that, uh, that system. So uh, here is my plan. Um, for sure, my commitment, and this is, this is pretty easy to achieve, is that everybody is going to be made whole. Every debt, every obligation, every deferral is going to be paid out this month. Um, I've got that squared away. And right now I'm trying to you know put together um, the cash needed there. Um, and the number one priority is we got to start doing some heavy fundraising. Uh, realistically speaking, I am going to be able to put in another three weeks uh, of just hard effort before I need to start to figure out other ways to 
pay for rent and health insurance and life insurance. Like that's kind of where I am personally at right now. Um, so this is this is my moment of truth um, in many ways. Uh, but like here, here's the truth. Like here is what I put into this thing and where all the money went, uh, which is into the org. And that is how much I believe in this thing. And I am still confident. Uh, I know how this is going to play out. It is just very difficult, very, very difficult. We are trying to solve hard problems and solving hard problems is painful. So, um, you know, uh, Elon Musk actually has this uh, great quote that he, uh, that I uh, finally understand, which is starting a business is like um, staring into the abyss and chewing glass. And I did not understand that whatsoever. But now I do understand that because when you're a startup, you are essentially uh, looking at death uh, all the time, like in terms of your organization. And you need to be able to, you know, take a death by a thousand cuts inside of you and chew on that glass all the time and keep a smile on your face <laughs> because you got to exude confidence and show that there is like a path forward. Um, so I, I get it. And uh, it's, uh, it's important that we just have to be brave. And I'm going to go into why that's key. Um, so anyway, that's the radical transparency. I hope it's very helpful for you guys. Uh, but hopefully it also explains like uh, the amount of stress that I'm going through. So sometimes I might be a little bit uh, uh, out of it and or short. So I apologize if that ever happens. So what we need to do is we need to fundraise hardcore. And the uh, here's like a kind of like a startup, uh, I don't know, theory, uh, which is essentially as you go through phases of building your company, you're going to go through specific uh, patterns. And so where we are right now is in this innovators and early adopter space and our cash flow is starting to burn low. And this is very, very common. This section here is called the valley of death, this moment where you start to burn through your initial seed fund and you're working on driving your cash flow and getting your investments. And so many startups fail at this moment where uh, they either don't have the capital or the tenacity to make it through that really, really hard stage. So the way we're going to get out of this valley of death is fundraising. And here's the great thing about Leyline is that we are nonprofit. So we have a very, very wide range of bringing in funding. So large donors, angel investors, social impact investors, and venture capital funds are the fastest way we can get cash to help us keep the keep the lights on uh, for the next few months or so as our key other revenue streams like sponsorships and crowdfunding start to kick in. So this one is going to be all hands on deck. Um, and so that's the that is a challenge that we face. Um, this is the abyss that I'm staring in. Uh, staring at, uh, and it gets closer every day, uh, which is uh, not fun. It is not fun. I'll say that. Um, so I stare at this valley of death, and I was thinking to myself, "Man, this is a this is a very brutal time." Um, you know, I went through. I've got. I've been going through some hard stuff. You know. Uh, you know, with death in the family and uh, lack of sleep because I got uh, two kids at home that are stuck here and have lost energy. Uh, and I was thinking, Oh my God, what am I going to do? Uh, can I make this thing happen? Uh, do I have what it takes? And, uh, you know, I've had doubts, uh, many, many doubts, and it's been a hard time. Um, so I was just thinking a lot through this past weekend and obviously starting to get catch up on sleep. And so I decided that there's only one practical, pragmatic thing to do in this scenario. And so I thought about, do I give up or do I keep on going despite things looking like uh, <laughs> it may not happen? Uh, and my reflection is we need to do this. We do not have a choice. And the answer why is this was the revel revelation to me starting this entire organization is that the pandemic has triggered this domino effect. And actually it's a domino effect that was already taking place, but it's just accelerated it um, to uh, orders of magnitude faster than it would have taken place naturally. So we have rising cases of COVID. And what happens is that that 
destroys our economy because it kills entire industries like live events and restaurants and bars, which, you know, consist of about 40% of the actual uh, labor market. And so if you look at the economic impact, this is data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The blue line here was the 2008 financial crisis, which literally took down the global economy and thrust millions, tens of millions of people into, into poverty. This is where we are now with 2020. We have dipped so far low that we're st our recovery is still at the very bottom of 2008. Um, this is very bad. This is extremely bad. Um, and I, I cannot stress enough how difficult a life uh, of poverty is. Um, it creates mental health issues, physical issues. It puts you into a mode where domestic violence and um, really terrible outcomes like addiction and suicide uh, uh, emerge. And this is going to be happening to the order of millions easily, and it's already starting to happen. So the problem with poverty is that it starts to erode the fabric of society and trust in institutions. And this is where we are now. You guys can see the narrative playing out. Um, and that is deeply concerning to me uh, because this is a global problem and because we are all one global society now. So if one of the major countries that is, you know, the key to the global economy starts to fall apart, um, we're looking at a bad, bad future. So, you know, this is, uh, you know, I could be wrong and I hope I'm wrong. I, I genuinely do, but we need to prepare for the worst and we need to be able to fight this problem because it's our responsibility. It's going to be our future and it's going to be our kids' futures that we're fighting for. And so I don't have a choice. Uh, <laughs> like I need to do this because I cannot see myself going back into the corporate sector where the entire economy is driven towards like you know the intention economy which steals your um time and blasts you with ads uh, i don't think that's going to help the world honestly maybe it'll like give me a paycheck and let me you know be comfortable but uh that's not sustainable so what can we do when we face a crisis of this magnitude Le with leyline we are creating an engine of infinite abundance we can eradicate poverty this is uh a thing that is possible there's nothing within the laws of physics that can stop this um or that doesn't uh, make this uh, possible and so what we need to do is be brave. We have to focus on what we can do and what the mission is and why this is so important. We can't give up. And we need to move fast because I, unfortunately it is too late. We are behind the curve on how we can solve these problems. Um, and in particular, climate change is right around the corner too. And we're talking about hundreds of millions displaced because of coastal cities not being sustainable. Um, and the you know the destruction of agriculture because of the climate adjustments uh, it, it's 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 very hard to process the magnitude of destruction we're going to be experiencing so we need to move fast we are behind schedule so we have secret weapons guys this is something that uh, we have a strategic advantage that we have not been leveraging and um this is our moment um here is the thing that we uh, are prepared for now is that we are an open source and open knowledge project. And so I want to give some examples around the power of open source and open knowledge. And one of them is Wikipedia. Wikipedia is the 13th most visited site on the planet. And it is a decentralized organization across the world of volunteers and admins and mods. And it's built by the community and the knowledge is shared freely with everybody. And so these type of open source projects just attract talent because people care about just improving the state of the world. They're not looking for any money. They're not looking for any reputation. They just want to do something. So that's a very powerful statement for us in that we have 70 plus people on this project and the vast majority are volunteers. And these are high caliber talent. Like You guys are high caliber talent um, working on this thing. And we're just beginning. Like the message is not even really spread uh, as far and wide as we as it can. 
Um, the great thing about open source is that it empowers everybody. Everybody has the ability to make a change, to commit code, to look at designs, to give feedback, to be a part of the decision-making process. Open source allows this knowledge to live forever. It is not dependent on one person. We can all like go take a vacation for the next 30 years and it'll still be there ready to um, be activated again. And we can scale it to the entire world. Um, so that's, that's the beauty of open source. And this is where we can conquer the private sector because no one company can compete with the entire planet participating on a platform. And that is what Wikipedia is, where it's the entire planet collaborating to share knowledge. And we can take the entire planet and collaborate to build a system of infinite abundance. Um, so yeah, that is a secret weapon. And we could do a lot of things here, which I'll get into in a little bit. But here's the other secret weapon is students. So I've spoken a lot about this, that the value proposition of Leyline as an open source project and open knowledge project is so powerful for students. Uh, it, uh, <clears throat> it allows people to get hands-on experience, which is the best way to learn, to network with experts and veterans, and to be a part of a community. It's also just this project is for the future. And who cares about the future? It is the young people that are going to be living longer than us and dealing with all the consequences of all the shit that we did. So these, uh, these students are looking for a way to participate and to help. And Nick Espinoza, our new QA team member, can probably share um, a lot of their experience. Um, and so the, it's a win-win because we're providing uh, skill training and job opportunity to these individuals. And I'm going to let Justin Gia speak to um, this a little bit uh, uh, in more detail in, uh, in just a second. Uh, but this is a powerful activation for us. So just one of our upcoming partnerships with NACEF, uh, they have a spread of over a thousand high schools uh, internationally. And that is a crazy amount of students that want to learn and want to do something good on an open source project or just any kind of project. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. So when I talk about activating an army, we can do this. This is very possible. And this is the real secret weapon is that we have spent this time building an organization that can scale. And that's the hardest part about startups is actually building to scale. The easy part is doing a proof of concept. You can whip up a prototype very easily. How you execu execute and bring it to market and allow for a larger team is really the hard part. So we, we've tackled more of the hard problems than the easy stuff. And that's really important because we need to move exponentially now. So we're built to scale in that we are empowering individuals, 100% remote, we're global, we're decentralized. And what we wanna do is continue to decentralize more of our governance and model. We're still uh, you know, top down in certain areas, but we wanna move towards um, activating hundreds of people working in parallel. And essentially, we've already got like sleeper cells across the world with volunteers that are kind of like, you know, waiting to be activated, etc. But it's there. Uh, second is we set up all of our process and tools. So we have our knowledge and project management through Notion and Miro. We have real time communications for our community on Discord and for our internal team on Slack. And we have a decentralized organization. So the quest system and quest hunter system, we've proven the concept, we still have a lot of work to do, but this can work. This model can absolutely work. And it's one that's designed for optimizing people versus profit. Um, and so that is the key. We have built this thing to scale, but we have not yet activated everybody. So now this is where we are. This is our moment of truth. And for me, my timetable is three weeks. We've got three weeks to build this product, to build our community and grow users, and then to just get these funds. We need to get these funds so that we can become real and hire the people we need to hire and pay them competitively and fairly and start giving money to the people. We need to get money into people's hands and help them out of this economic crisis. All right, so that is the presentation. And I'm going to open the floor for a few questions, uh, but uh, I still want to make some some time for Justin, about 10 minutes to go through the student ambassador stuff, and then also have time for Daniel to close that with some music. So how about we do this? How about we do this? How about we just have Justin go now, and then we wrap up, and we'll, I'll just stick around for however long to do Q&A, if that works.
but raise your hand if there's anything urgent that you want to tackle uh, very quickly. Otherwise, I'm going to hand it over to Justin. Hey, guys. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name's Justin. Uh, I go to UCI. I'm a fourth year currently, and I am building the Student Ambassador Program. Um, but yeah, like Eugenia said, um, thanks, Jeremy, for everything. And we're going to pull through this, and it's just, you know, a little, little dip. Let me show this real quick. Um, so this is a program overview of the Student Ambassador for those of you that haven't had the chance to get some more visibility. But um, I'm going to run through this since, like Jeremy said, there's around 10 minutes. Um, so the biggest goal and objective of the Student Ambassador Program is to build sort of a positive image amongst the college community. And as we know, the college community is one of the strongest and the biggest believers of Leyline. Um, they're huge believers in the future. And you know, all of them are really altruistic and want to create a meaningful impact in the community and in society as, as a whole. And so uh, most of the strategy we've already carried out. Um, so reaching out through our uh, pre-existing network of collegiate uh, students and collegiate programs, we're able to get quite a bit of applications for our uh, first uh, turnaround for the program. Um, what makes our program special is that we want to pair each stu student with a mentor that can actually help them with the hands-on skills that they're looking to develop throughout their ambassadorship. Um, so they're not going to be like traditional quest hunters because this is an unpaid position. We want to make sure that they're learning as much as possible um, instead of just being another worker for us. Well, they, they are going to be working quite a bit. Um, so we're starting with the US you know, phased approach um, just to understand the little kinks and fixes that we need to make before we roll this out to, you know, on like an international level. Um, pretty general uh, expectations for students. Um, they're going to be uh, university students over 18 uh, permitted to work. Um, how it's going to work is we're creating a quarter system, uh, very similar to UCs because that's what I'm familiar with. Um, so 10 week cycles where students are able to reapply for the next one if they found a lot of enjoyment uh, in this one. Um, you know, looking for a lot of diverse ambassadors from different universities and different backgrounds so we can really expand not only our network but our skill base as well. Um, and at the end of the program, uh, there is an opportunity for high achieving students to be converted into quest hunters. You know, that's a good chance for them to start earning some income and start, you know, uh, taking on bigger projects in the team. Um, so right now we're looking at 12 students that are going to be part of our initial batch of uh, student ambassadors. And for the mentors right now, I have uh, Eugenia uh, for marketing and biz dev, Blaine for game dev, um, engineering, that's uh, actually a call out for today's meeting, is someone that I need for a mentorship. Uh, I know Jeremy is connected with, with uh, some people, but if anyone wants to help out there, that'd be a huge help. Um, esports, uh, we have Justin Smith and potentially Hex. Uh, we have a call tomorrow, but things are sounding really good. And uh, accounting, a huge shout out to Shahul for stepping up. Uh, there's a student that has personally expressed interest in me that really wants to do more on the accounting side and we're able to make that happen, which I'm super happy about. Um, so the timeline for this program, um, we've already gone through our network and reached out to everyone, um, brought in the applications. Uh, I'm still talking to applicants as, it, as of last week and this week, but it should be done by a Wednesday of this week. Um, provide feedback, uh, and then we're gonna be onboarding these ambassadors, uh, integrating them into our team through like Slack and Notion, uh, putting them into uh, individual team pod syncs, daily, um, weekly, whatever that looks like, but having them as part of our team. And um, the, the biggest part of the program is assigning them a project that they're gonna be able to do quarter long um, that helps build their portfolio and helps them get uh, more experience and uh, face time with their mentors. Um, this is <laughs> a very brief timeline, but the biggest uh, takeaway here is the showcase at the end of week 10 where you know, we, we want them to showcase what they created during this quarter and being able to present something to the uh, larger internal team that's going to be able to push the needle for late line. Assignments and expectations, um, we want to keep it as light and simple as possible because you know, we have to bear in mind these are students that have like, a social life 
you know, academic career to focus on and as well as tons of other things, extracurricular and work, who knows. Um, but basic requirements are that they complete given projects in a timely manner. So, um, you know, we have, we have very basic uh, uh, progress being made every week. Um, maintaining communication, these are just, you know, weekly meetings and syncs with their individual mentors. Um, promote our social campaign, this is probably the biggest push for us, is, you know, we get to expand into their own personal networks of students that, you know, are very likely to jump onto Leyline and be a new user or alpha tester and, you know, contribute to our community. Um, what students can and cannot do, <laughs> this is really, really simple, but um, they can work on projects that are assigned by their mentors, join other pod things to sit in. The point of this is that we're making sure they're not just, uh, I guess, unpaid labor. Um, it's more of like a legal precaution that as an ambassador or as a mentee, that they're really getting more value out of the program than we are getting value out of them. Um, so that's just like a fine line to make sure we don't pass. Um, so they cannot work on projects that are unrelated to their specialization, you know, makes sense. Um, and they cannot complete quests for bounty. And like I said, the differentiation between quest hunters and student ambassadors. Um, so we're not compensating these students as it, it is a mentorship. Um, but like I said earlier, uh, if they are high achieving and great students at the end of the quarter, they're able to transition to a more official uh, status. So cost of ley line is super low. Um, I'm just gonna run through this because this is all like ad hoc uh, estimations. And these are some of our KPIs for uh, how well the program is at the end of the quarter. So percent of students that complete a cycle, percent of students that reapply for the next cycle, um, super basic stuff, student satisfaction, mentor satisfaction. This is gonna help us figure out whether or not we're making the right connections so between mentors and students and how well that personal experience was and that personal network was developed, which is huge for a lot of the students I spoke with. Um, amount of interaction from ambassadors and social posts. This is for us to kind of expand our network. Project completion, people enlisted from ambassador and referrals to beta. And this is kind of just like referral rate and churn. Um, do you want me to go over the NACEF tech as well, Jeremy, or is this okay for now? Yeah, I think the NACEF one is really good because it, it, it kind of outlines a ton of our value proposition to students and, and academic institutions. So it, it's mm -hmm. fantastic to share. Sure. Okay, um, let me just pull that up real quick. Give me one second, sorry guys. Um, I've also got it on the Notion page, Justin, if you want me to link you. Uh, I think I got it. Okay. Sorry, just being a little silly. Can you guys see this? Yep, coming through. Yes. Cool. Um, so we have a presentation for uh, NACEF later on today, but they are big fans of what we're doing. It's very in line with their foundation goals, which is to give back. And it also supports them in an area that they're lacking, which is uh, kind of altruism and community service for students on a scalable level. So as Jeremy said earlier, they have a thousand schools internationally, and it's just very difficult from a tech perspective to kind of leverage that type of tools into uh, you know an international scale. And we we have that. That's literally what our platform is built to do. Um, so this presentation is more geared towards what are the direct impacts we can do to help them uh, succeed in that goal. Like what type of scalable uh, impacts we can make. Um, so, oh, we, Justin, sorry to interrupt, right. but real quick, could you just give a quick, very, very brief overview of what NACEF is? Sure. Um, so NACEF is effectively, uh, it's called the North American Scholastic Esports Federation. So it started out in Orange County. Uh, they work with a bunch of public high schools through the Samueli Foundation and through the OC uh, School Board. And the idea is that through esports, um, we can make a lot of positive changes in students' lives uh, academically you know, get students that love uh, gaming to become engineers, to become STEM majors, to do all sorts of cool stuff uh, that are career related and help them succeed into a better future. And so they've done this for around two and a half years now. They're also a nonprofit, operate out of UC Irvine. And, um, you know, they're, they're looking to kind of scalably uh, support their efforts because their tech side is not as great. Um, and so a lot of it relies on Discord. And that's where we're going to be able to have the most leverage. Um, so, so we broke this down to kind of a student level 
a community level and a societal level, just so that they have a better understanding of what ley line is and what we can uh, really present for them. And so um, we probably know a lot of this information, so it's gonna be a little reminder. Um, so for student success, um, we have daily check-ins uh, like exercise, mood, and sleep that are gonna you know, overall better the student's health um, if they were to actively do it. Um, generate passive ley line points. Um, you know, they mention a lot of uh, income. Uh, th there's a big income variance between the students, and you know something like ley line could really help uh, the the rural or the or urban students, like inner city students that they work with. Educational resources. Um, so the first bullet is a little further down the line, but um, Jeremy told me this idea about the ley line creators, where we can really put together a lot of content that aren't made by teachers, <laughs> they're made by real working professionals that can give you the necessary skills to you know, succeed in the workplace. Um, student ambassador program, you know, a more hands-on version of that where you know, we wanna be able to one day onboard maybe even high schoolers as like job shadow, uh, mentees, um, depending on what sort of uh, legal precautions we have to make first. Um, digital resume, this is actually the biggest uh, biggest piece of the student uh, impact is that once they're applying to college, we want them to have a digital resume on Leyline where they can track all the community service that they've done, whether it's in person or digitally. And you know it can all be like fact checked by us. And that's really, really big for our students because most of it right now is just, <laughs> there, there isn't a lot of confirmation on what you did and when you did it. You just write it down on a piece of paper. Community level engagement, um, you no know, community service. Uh, we want to be able to host community service competitions through Leyline. Uh, we want to be able to host, um, you know, things like Habitat for Humanity, American Heart Association, like plug in APIs and be able to um, facilitate that entire process through us and, you know, get as many users as we can from their own community through this. Um, blood drives. Um, we, we, we all know we, we have the blood drives on a ley line. Um, so that's something that they're going to be able to tap into. Um, ra raising funds for the clubs, this is another huge piece as well. Um, so not all high school esports clubs have the same amount of funding, especially if you're at a more lower income uh, school, school district. And so this is a way that you know all students can kind of pitch together, uh, raise funds for the club through ley line by just you know, donating more computing power trading in ley line points for crypto or fiat currency and you know create really cool events by just generating funds without having to sell anything. Um, global impact, uh, we know most of this for volunteer computing. We know the awesome impact it has on the world. Um, as for student creators, um, you know we, we want them to be able to share their creations and share their ideas with the rest of the world, which is really huge and you know often isn't offered to high school students. Um, competition. Um, this is how we can tie in all the schools uh, from all these countries that they work with um, through Leyline, right? And th these competitions is basically you can have a school in Croatia compete with a school in Illinois on how much competing power they donated, how many exercise hours they donated, blood drives, everything. And so this is, you know, really, really, really cool to see, at least from NASA's perspective, because that's something they've wanted to do for two and a half years now, but just don't have the engineering capacity to do so. And, um, you know, they're willing to put up the students to kind of join in our community and help this cause. So their biggest uh, missions are the UN goals that we want to tie in. Um, they really see a lot of intersection between what we're creating here at Leyline and the, the, the UN goals that they want to uh, align themselves with. And so uh, you know, number one, number two, and number 13 are, you know, what, what we are activating on as of now. And we just want to expand to all 17 eventually. But um, that's pretty much it. All right, Justin, thank you so much for doing that. Um, and I, what I'd also say is that this is also a call to arms because this program could be incredibly powerful. 
uh, for many, many people, including all of us. So any way we can help Justin, particularly by volunteering to be a mentor, uh, can really go a long way. So uh, let's definitely touch base uh, outside of that and then let us know if you're interested in participating. <clears throat> Um, so we are perfectly at time and we are going to have Mr. Allen, uh, choose the music that he wants to play for us to close us out. And after we close out, uh, if anyone wants to stick around for Q and A, uh, I'll, I'll be here. All right, Daniel. Or before I start, I wanted to say uh, a thank you uh, to Jeremy for giving us this really honest account on what's been happening with Leyline. And I think it's, you know, important that we're all on the same page where we stand. So, you know, a huge amount of respect for you. That's a really difficult thing to do. Uh, with, with that in mind, I thought I'd share for 30 seconds something briefly that I read today that really stuck with me because, uh, you know, Jeremy talking about the future is scary. It, it sounds terrifying and there's a lot of bad stuff happening right now. But, um, I think that sometimes we tend to live a bit too much in the moment and we forget our history and where we came from. And the article I read was talking about a jawbone that was found in the Balkans. It was in an old cave, uh, hundreds of thousands of years old, and it was a lower jawbone belonging to a distant human cousin. And the teeth were broken. But we know that this human being lived on for 20 years after all its teeth were gone. And it means that the only way this jawbone, this person, was able to survive was because someone was feeding him. And I think that this is wonderful because, yes, there's a lot of bad stuff happening right now, but we share a common humanity across the board. And we've shared it for all of our history. 200,000 years ago, imagine distant cousins of ours huddled around a fire in the wilderness, knowing nothing about what's around them having created gods to understand the world and what they saw. And, you know, they have nothing in common with us, but what they shared is love and empathy for one another. Someone cared for another human being enough to feed them every day, keeping them alive. And that is something really beautiful, I find. And, you know, we should have our eyes on the stars, but let's remember where we came from as well and make sure to honor that as a collective. So I just wanted to say that and um i will be right back connecting from my phone from downstairs from the piano if you give me 30 seconds i'll be sprinting Bye -bye. all right thank you daniel that was a wonderful thing to say i'm definitely going to marry daniel in my next life <laughs> or his kids <laughs> Jeez. Uh, i mean if anything Jeremy, it's very inspiring to see the kind of work that you've been putting into this and the amount of dedication that you have. I think I speak for all of us when I say that we would all probably not be here for work for you, give or take. So, hello, hello. yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure if I should apologize for that, or <laughs> <laughs> I'm still. I'm still trying to figure that out. But, uh, but give me three weeks, and don't ever see apologize. How it out. Yeah. Not at all. I, you have we're all here on our own volition. You know, we oh yeah, no, we you. can all leave whenever we come. We love this. <laughs> we love you, it's man. About, it's about the story we weave for ourselves and the story that I've woven for you guys. So I, I appreciate you being all being here for this. It's a uh, it's a journey, that's for sure. Hello, everybody. I'm I'm back. Um, He's back. Okay. Yes, I'm back. So this is. Uh, I'm going to be starting off with a waltz, actually, given by, uh, written by Chopin, but I'm going to be doing an improvisation on it and sort of turning it into our own thing. Uh, so I hope you guys enjoy, and this you know, takes your mind off of a bit of the world burning outside right now. <laughs> Thank you. 
Fantastic, Daniel. Great, great job. Wonderful. Uh, again, I, I really want to stress how wonderful music is for all of our brains. It unlocks our creativity, improves our mood, connects us socially to each other. So it's super important that we have art and music in our lives every, every day. Uh, all right. So that officially closes our all hands meeting. So if anybody needs to check out, uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, if you guys want to stick around for any Q&A, feel free. We'll record it uh, as well. But uh, thank you very much, everybody. I love you. And you. we're going to do this thing. So stick with it. We're there. We're almost there. <laughs> thank you. Love you all. Okay, bye, bye, guys.